Rocky Side Cheese Tea House. Snow Country by Yasunari Kawabata. Part 3. Page 48. Probably to keep snow from piling up, the water from the baths was led round the walls of the inn by a makeshift ditch, and in front of the entrance it spread out like a shallow spring. A powerful black dog stood on the stones by the doorway, lapping at the water. Skis for the hotel guests, probably brought out from a storeroom, were lined up to dry, and the faint smell of mildew was sweetened by the steam. The snow that had fallen from the cedar branches to the roof of the public bath was breaking down into something warm and shapeless. By the end of the year, that row would be shut off from sight by the snowstorms. She would have to go to her parties in long rubber boots with baggy mountain trousers over her kimono, and she would have a cape pulled around her and a veil over her face. The snow would, by then, be ten feet deep. The woman had looked down on the steep road from the window of the inn, high on a hill, before daybreak this morning. And now, Shimomura was walking down the same road. Diapers hung high beside the road to dry. Under them stretched the vista of the border range, the snow on its peaks glowing softly. The green onions in the garden patches were not yet buried in the snow. Children of the village were skiing in the fields. As he started into the part of the village that fronted on the highway, he heard a sound as of quiet rain. Little icicles glistened daintily along the eaves. While you're at it, would you mind shoveling a little from ours? Dazzled by the bright light, a woman on her way back from the bath wiped at her forehead with a damp towel as she looked up at a man shoveling snow from a roof. A waitress, probably, who had drifted into the village a little in advance of the skiing season. Next door was a cafe with a sagging roof, its painted window flaking with age. Rows of stones held down the shingles with which most of the houses along the street were roofed. Only on the side exposed to the sun did the round stones show their black surfaces, less a moist black from the melting snow than an inkstone black, beaten away at by icy wind and storm. The houses were of a kind with the dark stones on their roofs. The low eaves hugging the ground seemed to have in them the very essence of the north country. Children were breaking off chunks of ice from the drains and throwing them down in the middle of the road. It was no doubt the sparkle of the ice as it went flying off into bits that enchanted them so. Shimomura, standing in the sunlight, found it hard to believe that the ice could be so thick. He stopped for a moment to watch. A girl of twelve or thirteen stood knitting apart from the rest, her back against a stone wall. Under the baggy mountain trousers, her feet were bare but for sandals, and Shimomura could see that the soles were red and cracked from the cold. A girl of perhaps two stood on a bundle of firewood beside her, patiently holding a ball of yarn. Even the faded ashen line of reclaimed yarn from the younger girl to the older seemed warmly aglow. He could hear a carpenter's plane in a ski shop seven or eight doors down the street. Five or six geisha were talking under the eaves opposite. Among them, he was sure, would be the woman, Komako. He had just that morning learned her geisha name from a maid at the inn. And indeed, there she was. She had apparently noticed him. The deadly serious expression on her face set her off from the others. She would, of course, flush scarlet, but if she could at least pretend that nothing had happened... Before Shimomura had time to go further with his thoughts, he saw that she had flushed to the throat. She might better have looked away, but her head turned little by little to follow him, while her eyes were fixed on the ground in acute discomfort. Shimomura's cheeks, too, were aflame. He walked briskly by, and immediately Komako came after him. You mustn't. You embarrass me walking by at a time like this. I embarrass you. You think I'm not embarrassed myself, with all of you lined up to waylay me? I could hardly make myself walk past. Is it always this way? Yes, I suppose so, in the afternoon. But I'd think you'd be even more embarrassed, turning bright red and then chasing after me. What difference does it make? The words were clear and definite, but she was blushing again. She stopped and put her arm around a persimmon tree beside the road. I ran after you because I thought I might ask you to come by my house. Is your house near here? Very near. 
I'll come if you let me read your diary. I'm going to burn my diary before I die. But isn't there a sick man in your house? How did you know? You were at the station to meet him yesterday. You had on a dark blue cape. I was sitting near him on the train, and there was a woman with him, looking after him, as gentle as she could be. His wife? Or someone who went from here to bring him home? Or someone from Tokyo? She was exactly like her mother. I was very much impressed. Why didn't you say so last night? Why were you so quiet? Something had upset her. His wife? Komako did not answer. Why didn't you say anything last night? What a strange person you are. Shimomura did not like this sharpness. Nothing he had done, and nothing that had happened seemed to call for it, and he wondered if something basic in the woman's nature might not be coming to the surface. Still, when she came at him a second time, he had to admit that he was being hit in a vulnerable spot. This morning, as he glanced at Komako in that mirror reflecting the mountain snow, he had of course thought of the girl in the evening train window. Why then had he said nothing? It doesn't matter if there is a sick man. No one ever comes to my room. Komako went in through an opening in a low stone wall. To the right was a small field, and to the left persimmon trees stood along the wall that marked off the neighbouring plot. There seemed to be a flower garden in front of the house, and red carp were swimming in the little lotus pond. The ice had been broken away and lay piled along the bank. The house was old and decayed, like the pitted trunk of a persimmon. There were patches of snow on the roof, the rafters of which sagged to draw a wavy line at the eaves. The air in the earthen-floored hallway was still and cold. Shimomura was led up a ladder before his eyes had become accustomed to the darkness. It was a ladder in the truest sense of the world, and the room at the top was an attic. This is the room the silkworms used to live in. Are you surprised? You're lucky you've never fallen downstairs, drinking the way you do. I have... But generally, when I've had too much to drink, I crawl into the kotatsu downstairs and go off to sleep. She pushed her hand tentatively into the kotatsu, then went below for charcoal. Shimomura looked around at the curious room. Although there was but one low window opening to the south, the freshly changed paper on the door turned off the rays of the sun brightly. The walls had been industriously pasted over with rice paper, so that the effect was rather like the inside of an old-fashioned paper box. But overhead was only the bare roof sloping down towards the window, as if a dark loneliness had settled itself over the room. Wondering what might be on the other side of the wall, Shimomura had the uneasy feeling that he was suspended in a void. But the walls and the floor, for all their shabbiness, were spotlessly clean. For a moment, he was taken with the fancy that the light must pass through Komako, living in the silkworm's room, as it passed through the translucent silkworms. The kotatsu was covered with a quilt of the same rough, striped cotton material as the standard mountain trousers. The chest of drawers was old, but the grain of the wood was fine and straight. Perhaps it was a relic of Komoko's years in Tokyo. It was badly paired with a cheap dresser, while the vermilion sewing box gave off the luxurious glow of good lacquer. The boxes stacked along the wall behind a thin woolen curtain apparently served as bookshelves. The kimono of the evening before hung on the wall, open to show the brilliant red under kimono. Komako came spryly up the ladder with a supply of charcoal. It's from the sick room, but you needn't worry. They say fire spreads no germs. Her newly dressed hair almost brushed the kotatsu as she stirred away at the coals. The music teacher's son had intestinal tuberculosis, she said, and had come home to die. But it was not entirely accurate to say that he had come home. He had, as a matter of fact, not been born here. This was his mother's home. His mother had taught dancing down on the coast, even when she was no longer a geisha. But she had had a stroke while she was still in her forties, and had come back to this hot spring to recover. The son, fond of machinery since he was a child, had stayed behind to work in a watch shop. Presently, he moved to Tokyo and started going to night school, and the strain was evidently too much for him. He was only twenty-five. All this, Komako told him with no hesitation, but she said nothing about the girl who had brought the man home, and nothing about why she herself was in this house. Shimomura felt most uncomfortable at what she did say, however. Suspended there in the void, she seemed to be broadcasting to the four directions. As he stepped from the hallway, he saw something faintly white through the corner of his eye. 
It was a chamisen box, and it struck him as larger and longer than it should be. He found it hard to imagine her carrying so unwieldy an object to parties. The darkened door inside the hallway slid open. Do you mind if I step over this, Komako? It was that clear voice, so beautiful that it was almost sad. Shimomura waited for an echo to come back. It was Yoko's voice, the voice that had called out over the snow to the station master the night before. No, please go ahead. Yoko stepped lightly over the chamisen box, a glass chamber pot in her hand. It was clear from the familiar way she had talked to the station master the evening before, and from the way she wore mountain trousers, that she was a native of this snow country. But the bold pattern of her obi, half visible over the trousers, made the rough russet and black stripes of the latter seem fresh and cheerful. And for the same reason, the long sleeves of her woolen kimono took on a certain voluptuous charm. The trousers, split just below the knees, filled out towards the hips, and the heavy cotton, for all its natural stiffness, was somehow supple and gentle. Yoko darted one quick, piercing glance at Shimomura and went silently out over the earthen floor. Even when he had left the house, Shimomura was haunted by that glance, burning just in front of his forehead. It was cold as a very distant light, for the inexpressible beauty of it had made his heart rise when, the night before, that light off in the mountains had passed across the girl's face in the train window and lighted her eye for a moment. The impression came back to Shimomura, and with it the memory of the mirror filled with snow and Komako's red cheeks floating in the middle of it. He walked faster. His legs were round and plump, but he was seized with a certain abandon as he walked along, gazing at the mountains he was so fond of, and his pace quickened, though he hardly knew it. Always ready to give himself up to reverie, he could not believe that the mirror floating over the evening scenery and the other snowy mirror were really works of man. They were part of nature, and part of some distant world. And the room he had only this moment left had become part of that same distant world. Startled at himself, in need of something to cling to, he stopped a blind masseuse at the top of the hill. Could you give me a massage? Let me see, what time will it be? She tucked her cane under her arm, and taking a covered pocket watch from her obby, felt at the face with her left hand. 2.35. I have an appointment over beyond the station at 3.30. But I suppose it won't matter, if I'm a little late. You're very clever to be able to tell the time. It has no glass, and I can feel the hands. You can feel the figures. Not the figures. She took the watch out again, a silver one, large for a woman, and flicked open the lid. She laid her fingers across the face with one at twelve and one at six, and a third halfway between at three. I can tell the time fairly well. I may be a minute off, one way or the other, but I never miss by as much as two minutes. You don't find the road a little slippery? When it rains, my daughter comes to call for me, at night, I take care of the people in the village, and never come up this far. The maids at the inn are always joking and saying it's because my husband won't let me go out at night. Your children are growing up. The oldest girl is twelve. They had reached Shimomura's room, and they were silent for a time as the massaging began. The sound of a shamisen came to them from the distance. Who would that be, I wonder? You can always tell which geisha it is by the tone. I can tell some of them. Some I can't. You must not have to work. Feel how nice and soft you are. No stiff muscles on me. A little stiff here at the base of the neck, but you're just right. Not too fat and not too thin. And you don't drink, do you? You can tell that? I have three other customers with physiques exactly like yours. A common sort of physique. But when you don't drink, you don't know what it really is to enjoy yourself, to forget everything that happens. Your husband drinks, does he? Much too much. But whoever it is, she's not much of a musician. Very poor indeed. Do you play yourself? I did when I was young. From the time I was eight till I was nineteen. I haven't played in fifteen years now. Not since I was married. Did all blind people look younger than they were? Shimomura wondered. But if you learn when you're young, you never forget. My hands have changed from doing this sort of work. But my ear is still good. It makes me very impatient to hear them playing. But then, I suppose, I felt impatient at my own playing when I was young. She listened for a time. Fumi, at the Izutsuya, maybe. The best ones and the worst are the easiest to tell. There are good ones? Komako is very good. She's young, but she's improved a great deal lately. 
Really? You know her, don't you? I say she's good, but you have to remember that our standards here in the mountains are not very high. I don't really know her. I was on the train with her music teacher's son last night, though. Oh, he's well again? Apparently not. Oh, he's been sick for a long time in Tokyo, and they say it was to help pay the doctor's bills that Komoko became a geisha last summer. I wonder if it did any good. Komoko, you say? They were only engaged, but I suppose you feel better afterwards if you've done everything you can. She was engaged to him? So they say. I don't really know, but that's the rumour. It was almost too ordinary a thing to hear gossip about geisha from the hot spring masseuse, and the fact had the perverse effect of making the news the more startling. And Komoko's having become a geisha to help her fiancé was so ordinary a bit of melodrama that he found himself almost refusing to accept it. Perhaps certain moral considerations, questions of the propriety of selling oneself as a geisha, helped the refusal. Shimamura was beginning to think he would like to go deeper into the story, but the masseuse was silent. If Komoko was the man's fiancé, and Yoko was his new lover, and the man was going to die, the expression, wasted effort, again came into Shimamura's mind. For Komoko thus to guard her promise to the end, for her even to sell herself to pay doctor's bills, what was it if not wasted effort? He would accost her with this fact, he would drive it home when he saw her again, he said to himself. And yet, her existence seemed to have become purer and cleaner for this new bit of knowledge. Aware of a shameful danger lurking in his numbed sense of the false and empty, he lay concentrating on it, trying to feel it, for some time after the masseuse left. He was chilled to the pit of his stomach, but someone had left the windows wide open. The colour of evening had already fallen on the mountain valley, early buried in shadows. Out of the dusk, the distant mountains still reflecting the light of the evening sun seemed to have come much nearer. Presently, as the mountain chasms were far and near, high and low, the shadows in them began to deepen, and the sky was red over the snowy mountains, bathed now in but a wan light. Cedar groves stood out darkly by the river bank, at the ski ground, around the shrine. Like a warm light, Komoko poured in on the empty wretchedness that had assailed Shimamura. There was a meeting at the inn to discuss plans for the ski season. She had been called in for the party afterwards. She put her hands into the kotatsu, then quickly reached up and stroked Shimamura's cheek. You're pale this evening. Very strange. She clutched at the soft flesh of his cheek, as if to tear it away. Aren't you the foolish one, though? She already seemed a little drunk. When she came back from the party, she collapsed before the mirror, and drunkenness came out on her face to almost comic effect. I know nothing about it. Nothing. Oh, my head aches. I feel terrible. Terrible. I want a drink. Give me water. She pressed both hands to her face and tumbled over with little concern for her carefully dressed hair. Presently, she brought herself up again and began cleaning away the thick powder with cold cream. The face underneath was a brilliant red. She was quite delighted with herself. To Shimamura, it was astonishing that drunkenness could pass so quickly. Her shoulders were shaking from the cold. All through August, she'd been near nervous collapse, she told him quietly. I thought I'd go mad. I kept brooding over something, and I didn't know myself what it was. It was terrifying. I couldn't sleep. I kept myself under control only when I went out to a party. I had all sorts of dreams, and I lost my appetite. I would sit there, jabbing at the floor, for hours on end, all through the hottest part of the day. When did you first go out as a geisha? In June. I thought for a while I might go to Hamamatsu. Get married? She nodded. The man had been after her to marry him, but she couldn't like him. She had had great trouble deciding what to do. But if you didn't like him, what were you so undecided about? It's not that simple. Marriage has so much charm. Don't be nasty. It's more that I want to have everything around me tidy and in order. Shimamura grunted. You're not a very satisfying person, you know. Was there something between you and the man from Hamamatsu? She flung out her answer. If there had been, do you think I would have hesitated? But he said that as long as I stayed here, he wouldn't let me marry anyone else. He said he would do everything possible to stand in the way. But what could he do from as far away as Hamamatsu? You worried about that? Komoko stretched out for a time, enjoying the warmth of her body. When she spoke again, her tone was quite casual. I thought I was pregnant. She giggled. It seems ridiculous when I look at back on it now. She curled up like a little child and grabbed at the neck of his kimono with her two fists. 
The rich eyelashes again made him think that her eyes were half open. Her elbow against the brazier, Komoko was scribbling something on the back of an old magazine when Shimamura awoke the next morning. I can't go home. I jumped up when the maid came to bring charcoal, but it was already broad daylight. The sun was shining in on the door. I was a little drunk last night. I slept too well. What time is it? It's already eight. Let's go have a bath. Shimamura got out of bed. I can't. Someone might see me in the hall. She was completely tamed. When Shimamura came back from the bath, he found her industriously cleaning the room, a kerchief draped artistically over her head. She had polished the legs of the table and the edge of the brazier almost too carefully, and she stirred up the charcoal with a practised hand. Shimamura sat idly smoking, his feet in the kotatsu. When the ashes dropped from his cigarette, Komoko took them up in a handkerchief and brought him an ashtray. He laughed, a bright morning laughed. Komoko laughed too. If you had a husband, you'd spend all your time scolding him. I would not, but I'd be laughed at for folding up even my dirty clothes. I can't help it, that's the way I am. They say you can tell everything about a woman by looking inside her dresser drawers. What a beautiful day. They were having breakfast and the morning sun flooded the room. I should have gone home early to practice the shamisen. The sound is different on a day like this. She looked up at the crystal clear sky. The snow on the distant mountains was soft and creamy, as if veiled in a faint smoke. Shimamura, remembering what the masseuse had said, suggested that she practice here instead. Immediately, she telephoned her house to ask for music and a change of clothes. So the house he had seen the day before had a telephone, thought Shimamura. The eyes of the other girl, Yoko, floated into his mind. That girl will bring your music. She might. You're engaged to the sun, are you? Well... When did you hear that? Yesterday. Aren't you strange? If you heard it yesterday, why didn't you tell me? But her tone showed none of the sharpness of the day before. Today, there was only a clean smile on her face. That sort of thing would be easier to talk about if I had less respect for you. What are you really thinking, I wonder? That's why I don't like Tokyo people. You're trying to change the subject. You haven't answered my question, you know. I'm not trying to change the subject. You really believed it? I did. You're lying again. You didn't really. I couldn't quite believe all of it, as a matter of fact. But they said you went to work as a geisha to help pay doctor's bills. It sounds like something out of a cheap magazine. But it's not true. I was never engaged to him. People seem to think I was, though. It wasn't to help anyone in particular that I became a geisha. But I owe a great deal to his mother. And I had to do what I could. You're talking in riddles. I'll tell you everything, very clearly. There does seem to have been a time when his mother thought it would be a good idea for us to get married. But she only thought it. She never said a word. Both of us knew, in a vague sort of way, what was on her mind. But it went no further. And that's all there is to tell. Childhood friends. That's right. But we've lived most of our lives apart. When they sent me to Tokyo to be a geisha, he was the only one who saw me off. I have that written down on the very first page of my very oldest diary. If the two of you had stayed together, you'd probably be married by now. I doubt it. You would be, though. You needn't worry about him. He'll be dead before long. But is it right for you to be spending your nights away from home? It's not right for you to ask. How can a dying man keep me from doing as I like? Shimamura could think of no answer. Why was it that Komoko said not a word about the girl, Yoko? And Yoko, who had taken care of the sick man on the train, quite as his mother must have when he was very young... How would she feel coming to an inn with a change of kimono for Komoko, who was something, Shimura could not know what, to the man Yoko had come home with? Shimamura found himself off in his usual distant fantasies. Komoko! Komoko! Yoko's beautiful voice was low but clear. Thank you very much! Komoko went out to the dressing room. You brought it yourself, did you? It must have been heavy. Yoko left immediately. The top string snapped as Komoko plucked tentatively at the shamisen. Shimamura could tell, even while she was changing the string and tuning the instrument, that she had a firm, confident touch. She took up a bulky bundle and undid it on the kutatsu. Inside were an ordinary book of lyrics and some twenty scores. Shimamura glanced curiously at the latter. You practice from these? I have to. There's no one here who can teach me. What about the woman you live with? She's paralysed. If she can talk, she ought to be able to help you. But she can't talk. 
She can still use her left hand to correct mistakes in dancing, but it only annoys her to have to listen to the shamisen and not be able to do anything about it. Can you really understand the music from only a score? I understand it very well. The publishing gentleman would be happy if he knew he had a real geisha, not just an ordinary amateur, practicing from his scores way off here in the mountains. In Tokyo, I was expected to dance, and they gave me dancing lessons, but I got only the faintest idea of how to play the shamisen. If I were to lose that, there would be no one here to teach me again, so I use scores. And singing? I don't like to sing. I did learn a few songs from my dancing, and I managed to get through them, but newer things I've had to pick up from the radio. I've no idea how near right I am. My own private style, you'd laugh at it, I know. And then my voice gives out when I'm singing for someone I know well. It's always loud and brave for strangers. She looked a little bashful for a moment, then brought herself up and glanced at Shimamura as though signalling that she was ready for him to begin. He was embarrassed. He was, unfortunately, no singer. He was generally familiar with the Naguta music of the Tokyo theatre and dance, and he knew the words to most of the repertoire. He had had no formal training, however. Indeed, he associated the Naguta less with the parlour performance of the geisha than with the actor on the stage. The customer is being difficult. Giving her lower lip a quick little bite, Komiko brought the shamisen to her knee and, as if that made her a different person, turned earnestly to the lyrics before her. I've been practising this one since last fall. A chill swept over Shimamura. The goose flesh seemed to rise, even to his cheeks. The first notes opened a transparent emptiness deep in his entrails, and in the emptiness, the sound of the shamisen reverberated. He was startled. Or, better, he fell back as under a well-aimed blow. Taken with a feeling almost of reverence, washed by waves of remorse, defenceless, quite deprived of strength, there was nothing for him to do but give himself up to the current, to the pleasure of being swept off wherever Komiko would take him. She was a mountain geisha, not yet twenty, and she could hardly be as good as all that, he told himself. And in spite of the fact that she was in a small room, was she not slamming away at the instrument as though she were on the stage? He was being carried away by his own mountain emotionalism. Komiko purposely read the words in a monotone, now slowing down and now jumping over a passage that was too much trouble. But gradually, she seemed to fall into a spell. As her voice rose higher, Shimamura began to feel a little frightened. How far would that strong, sure touch take him? He rolled over and pillowed his head on an arm, as if in bored indifference. The end of the song released him. Ah, this woman is in love with me. But he was annoyed with himself with the thought. Komiko looked up at the clear sky over the snow. The tone is different on a day like this. The tone had been as rich and vibrant as her remark suggested. The air was different. There were no theatre walls. There was no audience. There was none of the city dust. The notes went out crystalline into the clean winter morning to sound on the far snowy peaks. Practising alone, not aware herself of what was happening perhaps, but with all the wideness of nature in this mountain valley for her companion, she had come quite as a part of nature to take on this special power. Her very loneliness beat down sorrow and fostered a wild strength of will. There was no doubt that it had been a great victory of the will, even granted that she had had an amount of preparatory training, for her to learn complicated airs from only a score, and presently go through them from memory. To Shimamura, it was wasted effort, this way of living. He sensed in it too a longing that called out to him for sympathy. But the life and way of living no doubt flowed thus grandly from the shamisen with a new worth for Komako herself. Shimamura, untrained in the niceties of shamisen technique, and conscious only of the emotion in the tone, was perhaps an ideal audience for Komiko. By the time she had begun her third song, the voluptuous softness of the music itself may have been responsible. The chill and the goose flesh had disappeared, and Shimamura, relaxed and warm, was gazing into Komiko's face. A feeling of intense physical nearness came over him. The high, thin nose was usually a little lonely, a little sad, but today, with the healthy, vital flush on her cheeks, it was rather whispering, I am here too. The smooth lips seemed to reflect back a dancing light, even when they were drawn into a tight bud. And when for a moment they were stretched wide, as the singing demanded, they were quick to contract again into that engaging little bud. Their charm was exactly like the charm of her body itself. 
Her eyes, moist and shining, made her look like a very young girl. She wore no powder, and the polish of the city geisha had over it a layer of mountain colour. Her skin, suggesting the newness of a freshly peeled onion, or perhaps a lily bulb, was flushed faintly, even to the throat. More than anything, it was clean. Seated rigidly upright, she seemed more demure and maidenly than usual. This time, using a score, she sang a song she had not yet finished memorising. At the end, she silently pushed the plectrum under the strings and let herself fall into an easier posture. Her manner quickly took on a touch of the seductive and alluring. Shimamura could think of nothing to say. Komako did not seem to care particularly what he thought of her playing, however. She was quite unaffectedly pleased with herself. Can you always tell which geisha it is from the tone of the shamisen? That's easy. There aren't twenty of us altogether. It depends a little on the style, though. The individual comes out more in some styles than in others. She took up the shamisen again and shifted her weight so that her feet were a little to one side and the instrument rested on the calf of one leg. This is the way you hold it when you're small. She leaned toward the shamisen as though it were too large for her. Dark hair. Her voice was deliberately childish and she picked out the notes uncertainly. Dark hair was the first one you learned? Uh Uh-uh. She shook her head girlishly as no doubt she did in the days when she was still too small to hold the shamisen properly. Wakisashi's Tea House. Please subscribe.